modern square of opposition. If you're following along with us, we're using the Hurley textbook. Um, okay, so let's start here. Um, Venn diagrams and the modern square of opposition. Let me start off here by doing a sort of quick review um, because you'll see that um, you probably have noticed already that we're sort of slowly building up in terms of what categorical propositions are and how they relate to each other. So what's the quick review? Now remember we looked at, we ended, we concluded last time by recognizing that there's four different propositions the A, the E, the I, and the O, and that they have different distribution patterns. We're going to continue our discussion today by looking at how they can relate um, by looking at, uh, we're going to sort of firm up what Venn diagrams are and how they relate in by using a medieval device known as the square of opposition. We're going to be looking at the modern, um, the, the more simplistic version um, of the square of opposition, also referred to as the modern square of opposition. So we have these four type of propositions. Um, so let's put that off to the side for a minute and let's quickly discuss um, existential import. Um, the what we're going to really be talking about here is the notion of the existential fallacy. We're going to come to that at the very end of um, our talk today. But let's start talking about what is existential import. Well, you can see the root word here of existential, it sounds like it's a really sort of complicated term, but it's not really actually. The root term there is to exist. So what is existential import? That means an exis a cl uh, proposition has existential import if a claim of existence is made. Okay, Not all propositions, categorical or otherwise, necessarily make a claim of existence. Um, so, uh, we have existential import and whether or not a, a, um, a proposition has existential import, you have to ask the question, does it make a claim about existence? Now of course, think about it. Let me just flip here to the textbook and you can see here why this is sort of an important distinction to make. right? Um, so let's take this example. All Tom Cruise movies are hits. right? Which is not true, actually, I don't think. Uh, but you can see here, all Tom Cruise movies are hits. This does have existential import because we know that Tom Cruise exists, and so we know that it's making a claim about something that exists. Whereas, for instance, if I say all unicorns are one-horned animals, this statement doesn't make a claim about existence, does it? Um, and the reason it doesn't is because I know that unicorns are not something that are, that's true. Right, <coughs> so this doesn't make a claim of existence, right? So that's what existential import refers to, or that's what the issue is about. Now, there's two basic approaches to the question of looking at existential import. The first is what we're going to call, or what your book refers to here, as the Aristotelian perspective, or the Aristotelian standpoint. So let's put Aristotle up here. The other perspective is actually the perspective of a uh, eminent contemporary, well, I don't know if it's contemporary, but a modern logician by the name of George Boole. What's Aristotle's view? Something makes a claim of existence um, if, it, if the subject terms refer to real things, right? So think about it like that. If the terms refer to real things, right? then that means you have a claim of existence. Right? If it refers to, I'm sorry my handwriting is hard to read here, if it refers to real things. Okay, what's Bull's perspective? That means that things that are imaginary, things that are made up like unicorns, are do not have existential import on Aristotle's view because it doesn't refer to things that we would consider to be real. Now what's Bull's view? Well, Bull we're going to see as much is a little bit more nuanced and I think actually more sophisticated view um, where Boole says wait a second obviously things have does it have existential import well yes if it refers to real things to real particulars but no uh, a statement doesn't have uh, a claim of existence if it refers to universals. 
it refers to universals. Now why is that? Even if we consider those universals real, but that's the whole question. Um, because here's the thing we have to consider. Um, it, do we have universal knowledge? Let's make a universal claim. Now obviously we would say that no, it doesn't have existential import if it refers to imaginary objects. Right, so there's no existential import there, like unicorns and stuff. So Aristotle and Boole both agree that if you talk about unicorns, you're not making an existential claim. But Boole, in, addi in addition and further than Aristotle, he argues that if you make a universal claim, let's say for instance, all right, um, let's see, all worlds are things with mass. Right, so let's make that our claim. If we say all worlds are things with mass, does this imply existence? The answer Bull says is no, it doesn't. Why? It goes to the question of can universals be known? And this is actually a very deep and well-known problem is the problem of universals here. Can a universal be known? Uh, that's sort of the question here. Aristotle thought that you could, in fact, have universal knowledge, meaning that he thought that, because think about how do we gain knowledge? We gain knowledge primarily through observation. We observe things about the world. So how do I know there's trees in the world? Because I see trees, okay? So if I make a claim like some trees are green and some trees are brown, etc., etc., right? Th those make claims about existence because I can know whether or not those things actually exist. Because if existence is what we're talking about, how do you know something exists? But what if I make a claim like all trees are plants? All trees are plants. Now that makes sense conceptually for us because we've, we're sort of used to categorizing plants and types of plants and that sort of thing. But wait a second, that's a universal claim. To say that all trees are plants, now the question is do I know that that claim actually implies existence? The answer Boole says is no, it doesn't, because you don't have universal knowledge, right? You would have to literally go throughout the entire universe, or rather the entire the universe of the entire class, and double check each one of those particular elements to know if it exists. So he argued that you can never have universal knowledge. It's actually sort of almost by definition impossible, right? Um, so if you can't know universals. Can a universal be known? No, which means that universals have no existential import. That was Boole's insight. There's no existential import. All right, there's no existential import. Okay, and that's sort of a really critical uh, discovery, and we're going to see why here in a little bit here. So. Um, so that's the first thing to recognize here between there's the Aristotelian perspective and there's the Boolean perspective. Uh, both agree, again, that if you talk about things that aren't real, there's no existential claim. But the difference is that Aristotle thinks that, yes, universal statements can have existential import. They do make claims about existence, whereas George Boole says, no, they don't. Right, um, And we're going to see that it's ultimately I think we have to go with, I think Boole is the person to trust in this regard but um, that's sort of a really critical juncture okay and we're gonna talk more about that a little bit in a little later from now um, okay so they do make claims about existence so now what I want to talk to you about here's Venn diagrams um, and we've already been using Venn diagrams so and most of you probably have even encountered Venn diagrams when you took your mathematics courses um, Venn diagrams is essentially their ways of diagramming pictorially or graphically um, a categorical proposition. Okay, what you do is you draw two overlapping circles, which represents different possible states. Now, we're going to have to write a key up here. If something here's the rules you're going to see, and it'll it's going to be a little bit confusing, but if you fill something in, that means there's empty space. Right? But if you put an X, that means at least one exists. Okay, So this is the key. And these are the tools. What we're allowed to do in the Venn diagrams is either fill things in or put X's in. Okay. Now, let's take our four propositions. 
we have an A proposition. A, and the A proposition would look like, here I'll quickly do it again, S and the P. All, the A proposition says that all of the S's are P's. So how do we fill, represent that? Well, the, the answer is what we would do is we fill it in. We fill in this space here. Okay, because what this means is that that all of the S's are here, and out here is emptiness. There's nothing out there, right? Or at least there's no S's out there. So all of the S's are contained here, and you can see they're nicely sort of drawn in within the P's. So that means all of the S's are P's. You can see it has to deal with the distribution. Where we, the distribution of an A statement is the S to the P. And you can see here we sort of literally pushed over the S's into the P circle. Now what about the E proposition? The E proposition to remind you is, I should write them up for you, is no S or P. So first thing we would diagram that by drawing two circles, putting an S and a P down. I'm going to change my color here. And in this case, we would draw, actually, we'd fill in this little football spot, right? But this means empty space. That's what our rule is when we fill things in. So what this says is that none of the S's are P's. And by the way, look at it. All of the S's are separate from the P's. So this represents no S or P. That's how you diagram the E statement. You'll notice that, they, that you only use the fill. You fill when you have universal... Um, statements. And you're going to see you use an X when you have particular statements. Okay, so let me scroll down here and let's show you the I and the O. Okay, so the I statement says that some S or P and the O statement says that some S are not P. So again, we're just going to draw the circle here for some S or P and a P. You should always label. And again, it's standard form to always put the S first and the P second. I um, mean, that's a general rule we want to apply um, in the midst of this course because uh, that way we all have a universal way of sort of assessing each other's work uh, that makes sense. So, since this is a particular claim, I have to use right a, an X, right? So that means that where should I put the X? There's, three pla there's only two places I can either put the X. I can put the X here, I put the X in the circle, in the in the overlap area. Well, this is some of the S's or P's. Now, remember the distribution. What gets distributed? None. Neither gets distributed, right? So that means that I actually put the S right here, the X right there rather, because this says that there is at least one S, and that S is also a P. It's within both circles, but you can see it's not distributed because there's no way of knowing anything about any particular circle by itself. Okay. Now what about over here? Where would I put the X here for some S or not P? And sorry, my handwriting's horrible on this. Um, the answer is I'd put it right here, right? Because this says that there are some S's in the universe. Uh, there are some S's, but those S's are not P. So I can't put it in the football, the sort of middle s section that overlaps. I have to put it over here with the S's, okay? So this is the, this is essentially the four ways you can diagram. Uh, you can diagram what these um, propositions say and mean. Now, you'll see later that it's actually a really sort of critical feature because the um, it will actually allow us, oh, sorry about that, uh, the Venn diagrams we'll see will actually allow us to test whether or not arguments are valid eventually. So the Venn diagrams actually become very helpful and uh, there's sort of two types of people in the world I find. There's the there's the people who are good at geometry, and those people sort of need graphic illustrations. They sort of understand things spatially. Um, and th I think those people do really well with Venn diagrams. But we'll see there's, these, there's other, other tools to help assess arguments. And one of them is known as the square of opposition. Um, and I think the square of opposition helps a lot of people who are maybe less pictorially declined. There's, if you're not a geometry person, maybe you're an algebra person. So this is the square of opposition. Uh, and we'll see, we're going to relate them all together, okay? Now, the square of opposition, today we're only looking at what we refer to as the modern square of opposition, which means that this is the more rudimentary, the simpler one, um, or modern in the sense that it's the Boolean square of opposition rather than the Aristotelian, going back again to the existential import thing. So, Venn diagrams. Um, here, I can show you, if you have the book on page, what is it, 209... 
Right. Okay. So you can see here, they're just talking about Venn diagrams. Okay, so here are the four possible ways of doing the Venn diagrams. So the modern square of opposition. Okay, here's what the modern square of opposition looks like. We're going to take each of our four propositions, the A, the E, the I, and the O. We're going to arrange them into a square. Then we're going to draw lines in between each of those, those statements, which represents I any of the possible, in fact, all of the possible relationships between those two statements, given that only two of them can interact at the same time. So we have the A, the E, the I, and the O. Okay. Now, what's the? There's four. It's possible for these two to relate to these two. These two to relate to these. These, these, and these. Okay. Oh, and finally the bottom one. So these are the four possible relationships. Now, what is it that can be known? Now, what? How do these two relate to each other? We're going to mainly focus today on the diagonals. In fact, that's all we're going to focus on, right? What are the diagonals? What's the relationship between the diagonals? And we're going to see that the answer is that the di diagonals are always contradictory. They're always contradictory. Now, what does contradictory mean? What is a contradiction? I mean, that's an important philosophical question here, especially in logic. What is a contradiction? A contradiction is when you say something both is and is not at the same time, in the same way, and in the same respect. Right? It's to say something both is and is not. It's to say something that's, it's, for instance, to say that um, I'm in the room and I'm not in the room. That's a contradiction, right? Only one of those can be true, but they can't both be true, right? A contradiction is any error in reasoning can always be traced back to a contradiction. It's sort of a very, very critical concept. Uh, going all the way back to Aristotle and his discussion um, of the law of non-contradiction or law of contradiction. Okay, so these are contradicting. Now what about these relationships here? These uh, horizontal and vertical relationships? Well, since we're talking about the modern square of opposition, the answer is we don't know. Okay? That means that these are logically undetermined. They're unknown. We don't know what the relationship is, and part of it has to do ultimately with the existential fallacy, uh, but it has to do with Boole's interpretation. But we're not going to, I don't want to go too deep because I want you to understand it. We're going to ignore these relationships right now. The only relations we care about in 4.3 here are these diagonal relationships. Okay? So the modern square of opposition looks like this again. Let me go back over here. Okay? So that means that these are contradictory. And this should make sense, actually, when you think about it. Um, because think about what is an A statement, right? An A statement says that all S or P, so let's say all S or P. Now, an A statement says that all S or P, or let's give the example, all dogs are animals. We can say that the S's are dogs and the P's are animals. And let's compare them, right? Because up here we said that, right, that the A is contradictory to the O. So let's, what's an O statement look like? An O statement says that some S are not P, right? Which says that some dogs are not animals. Now just think about it for a moment. Could it be the case that all dogs are animals, therefore some dogs are not animals? No. That doesn't make any sense, actually. That's a contradiction. In fact, Look here at the, what the Venn diagrams look like. The A Venn diagram looks like this, where we've got this circle filled in. And what does the O diagram look like? It looks like this. You can see here, these things can't be true at the same time. Because this says there's empty space, and this says something exists there. How can both of those be the simultaneous? The answer is they can't, right? <laughs> it's a contradiction. Right? So that's what, how the A is a contradiction to the O. Simultaneously, think about the E and the I. How do the E and the I statements look? An E statement says what? Um, no S or P. What does the diagram look like? It looks like this. Right? And what does the I statement look like? Um, the I statement says that some S or P, 
And if we did the diagram for it, S and P, S and P, we have an X in the middle. You can see here, these can't be true simultaneously, right? Because the um, this is supposed to be empty space, and this precise says something is not the case. They can't be true simultaneously. The E and the I are contradictory terms, okay? So now what we can do is let's combine the Venn diagrams we've discussed with the square of opposition, and what we're going to get is actually a very powerful tool that's going to really help us make sense of a lot of this stuff. So let's do the A, the E, the I, and the O, right? Now, what do we say here? Let me let me just draw what they look like here. Um, the circles. And when you do your homework, I would suggest you draw something out that looks just like this. So you have the A and then the E statement looks like this. And then you have the I statement, which means, which if we draw it looks like this, I'm sorry. And then if we drew the O statement, we have this, okay? Now let's switch to this. How are the I and the O related? These are contradictory. And how are these two related? These are also contradictory. Okay? So, now, but what, what about these? This relationship, unknown, 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 unknown. Okay? So, th we can use this to now take a look at what are known as immediate inferences and then we can test whether or not those immediate inferences actually are logically valid. Now let's quickly sort of maybe do a quick primer. We'll come back to this thing I just drew out here. And remember here that what is validity? Uh, validity is when if the premise is true the conclusion must necessarily follow or in other words that there's truth functional proposition where the conclusion will always be true if the premise is true, right? Now, there's different types of validity. There's what we're going to call conditional validity, and there's going to be what we call unconditional validity. Now, unconditional validity, we're going to see is are those propositions where both Boole and Aristotle agree, and conditional validity are propositions where Aristotle would say they're valid. And then, propositions are invalid, they uh, Propositions can be invalid, but then they can also be, interestingly enough, um, unknown, Lo or what we would, what your book refers to here as logically undetermined. So those are the possibilities when we test an immediate inference. <coughs> so wait, what is an immediate inference? How do we test um, immediate inference? Now, immediate inference is when you take when you make one when you take one uh, categorical proposition and then conclude immediately something from that categorical proposition it's not a full-fledged argument because there's only one premise and one conclusion um, so they're just sort of immediate inferences but you'll see let me give you let me um, let's go here to take a look at the the book okay um, let me scroll down here testing immediate inferences. Let's go back here. So here's an example of an immediate inference. Um, some t are not m, therefore it's false that all t are m. Right? Um, so let's, let me get in. You know, we can snip this and we can use this and sort of diagram this right now. Right? So this says that some t are not m. Right? So the first thing to do, what are the steps? The first thing to do is, uh, number one, assume the premise is true. Because <laughs> remember, we're looking to see whether or not they're logically valid, not sound. right? So we're going to assume the first premise is true. And then we're going to, I, number two, then you need to identify um, each proposition. Right? So some t or not m, what kind of proposition is that? That is an O proposition. 
and then here therefore it's false that all t are m this is an a proposition so what this is saying is that I'm going to assume this is true and this conclusion is saying that a is false so the question is does that inference work is it true now if we go back to our square of opposition here scroll up here right we had an O statement, we're assuming the O statement's true, which means that if it's co the contradiction of the O would be an A statement, the A statement would have to be false, right? It would have to be false, which means that this is a valid inference. This is a valid inference. Now, is it conditionally valid or, um, is it conditionally valid or is it universally valid? The, the answer is it is going to be conditionally valid. It's conditionally valid because we're concluding with a universal, right? We've gone from uh, here. We've gone from a um, particular to a universal. Remember what did Boole say? He said that universal claims don't denote existence, right? Which means that we can't know whether or not this is true. This true would be true for Aristotle, but not for Boole. So therefore, we have what we would call conditional validity. Okay. Um, so let's go back here to our thing. So how do we test immediate inferences? Again, one, we assume that the, pro the pre first premise is true. Number two, we identify what the uh, statements are. And then we use the square of opposition or we use a Venn diagram to ascertain whether or not it's true or not. Okay, so let me go back here to your book because you're going to see that your what about if you want to just use Venn diagrams? I think it's helpful to use either one of them. Uh, the first thing to diagram is you have to always diagram what is the case. What happens if you get a statement like this? It is false that all A are B. How the heck am I going to do that? Because if it's false, then what should it look like? Well, here's where we can go back to the square of opposition, right? Um, let's take our example again. It is false that all A are B. Right, so that means that all A or B. This is we're supposed to assume this is. I'm sorry, we're supposed to assume that this is false. So how do we diagram? How do I diagram something that's false? Here's the thing: you should never diagram something that's false. So what? Let's take. Let's use the square of opposition, right? I know that if let's go back up to here, I have an A proposition. If it's false, then the O proposition has to be true, right? So that means I should diagram this. In order to diagram a false proposition, then I'm going to diagram this, right? Which basically says some s or not p, but using, because it's contradictory, if this is false, then this is true, right? So then let's go back here. So you go to your book, because what was the example you gave? Uh, it is false that all are b. Uh, so that's how we diagram what's false. So that means if you have a proposition that starts with something like it is false that, you should immediately think, oh, I have to diagram the opposite, the, the contradictory ver version. So you can use the square of opposition to determine that. And then you can sort of go through the problems, right? So let's take this example here. It is false that all A, uh, the, let's, let's go like this actually. Okay, so here we go. It is false that all A or C, how should we do this? First, this is obviously an A proposition, but since it's an A proposition that's false, right, then that means I use the square of opposition, right, A, E, I, O, right, and I say, oh, if this is false, then this must be, if the, if the A is false, then the O must be true. So I diagram the O proposition, which lo and behold looks like this. Right, it looks just like this one. Now, what's the, therefore, no MRC. So then the next thing to do to test the immediate inference is diagram what the conclusion looks like. Right, what does the conclusion look like? Well, no MRC looks like this. So here's the question. Can you read this? Can you gather this from this? And the answer is no, you can't. Why? Uh, it's, let's go, right? So you, you can see how it says, this inference is invalid. Here the conclusion, 
the conclusion diagram asserts that the overlapping area is empty. Since inf this information is not contained in the premise diagram, the inference is invalid. The question is, can you read the conclusion from the premise? I can't in this case, so it's invalid, right? Which means you can't go. Why is it invalid? Ultimately, you can't go from a particular to a universal. Okay, uh, take a look at this one. Let's try this one. Okay, all cell phones are wireless devices. I'm going to assume it's true, and that's an A statement. So here it's dr it's drawn out for me. Notice you're supposed to put the C and the W for C for cell phones and W for wireless devices. And so the question is, can I read this from this? All CRW, therefore some CRW. Well, you can see here that the C's have to be in here. That's the only place they ever could be. Right? And look, we have an X here, which means I can read this diagram from this one. Right? So this is a valid form. Right? But let's see, what does the book say? One of the things I find that's helpful is that when you do this, is to, is to diagram yourself and then see if it makes sense. Um, so you can see here, um, this one he says the information of the conclusion diagram is not contained in the premise diagram so the inference is invalid however if the premise were interpreted as having existential import then the C circled in the premise diagram would not be in, uh, empty specifically there would be members in the overlap area this would make the inference valid okay uh, so maybe I should sit here and explain this one of the things we need to do here is Aristotle assumes that universals have truth ha actually refer to things. So for Aristotle, there's actually X's up here, right? And the way we represent that actually is by putting an X with a circle around it, which means that we're taking Aristotle's assumption here. The universals do make truth claims, existential claims. Whereas down here, the X. So the X always means that something exists. You can see here, if we put these here, then we can read the diagrams accordingly. Uh, let's do another example here, just so you can see what I have, in, what we have in mind. And I know this is a lot to take in. This chapter is actually fairly um, lengthy, right? So let's do a couple of exercises here, where it says, um, use the modern square of opposition. No, no. Use Venn diagrams. Here. We'll just use a Venn diagram anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, let's take three problems here and let's take a look at each of these problems. Okay, the first one here is no sculptures by Rodin are boring creation creations. So this is an E statement, and this is therefore all sculptures by Rodin are boring creatures. That's an A statement. Moving from an E to an A is logically undetermined, right? Because that's it. Remember, we have the A, the E, the I, and the O. We can only make claims here using the modern square of opposition by using the diagonals. These horizontal, the E, the A, the E is a horizontal relation, which means that it's unknown. So from our perspective, it's invalid. Uh, it's logically undetermined. Right. So that would be answer number one. Right. Um, now. Secondly, let's take the second one. It is false that some lunar craters are volcanic formations. Therefore, no lunar craters are volcanic formations. Here, it's this is an some s. I'm sorry, some l r v. That's what that says. So we can. It may be helpful just to diagram it. And this is supposed to be false. So some l r v. And then the conclusion, therefore, is that it is to assume it's true is that no l R V. Okay, so the question is: so if this is false, that this is a I statement, and this is a E statement, right? So if this is false, the E statement has to be true. Using the square of opposition, this is actually a valid inference. Okay. Now, but wait a second. You're thinking, does that work? Because what if we do the then diagram. Oops. Let's do it down here. How would I diagram the conclusion, sum L or V? So it's false. Well, it's false. I said diagram was actually is true. 
right? And what is true is that if some LRV is false, then the E statement has to be true, which is this, right? And we'll put an X in the middle here, which represents the Aristotelian assumption of validity, but not the Boolean, right? And what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that no LRV. You can see, I can read the conclusion from the premise, so this means that this is valid. And you can see this is actually unconditionally valid uh, because it doesn't. I don't. I can read the conclusion from the premise without this thing. This thing doesn't matter. This um, existential marker, right? So let's look at problem number three. All trial lawyers. Let me write it over here. And you'll see that the best way to do these problems in your homework is to write them out like this. All T are P. All trial lawyers are people with stressful jobs. Therefore, the three dots means therefore. Therefore, sum T R P. So let's take a look at this. Go back over here to our diagram. All at all T or P, right? That's an A statement. Right? Here, let me change. Well, oh well. Um, blue pen. Let me do a blue pen. This is an A statement. And sum T or P is an I statement. So we've gone from an A to an I, right? We haven't covered that yet. So this is an invalid um, argument. Why? It's invalid because the relationship is logically undetermined. It's an unknown value, right? So you can't go, right? You can't make that downward relationship. We can only use the across. Take a look at it like this, too. If we diagram the first premise, it would say that all of the T's are P's. And then we also diagram the conclusion, sum t or p is an x. Okay. Now, wait a second. Let's put our existential marker in here. Remember, this should, represents Aristotle's assumption. So note, take a look here. Can I read the conclusion from the premise? You can see I can read it, actually. I can read it if I use Aristotle's assumption, because look, the x is here, which means I can read this from here. So that means that actually this is conditionally valid if we, by using the Venn diagrams, we re realize that it is conditionally valid. Now, why is that? That's because we're going to see in our next section that all of these lines, Aristotle worked out the truth conditions for these lines. But it all assumes, on Aristotle's view, that we assume that universals make existential claims. Um, so that's why the existential fallacy here that's why I think um, your author Hurley here is combining Venn diagrams, existential fallacies, and all this stuff all in one. Okay, we're going to see that what is the the last sort of element in this chapter, and then I'll close off here. And what you're probably going to have to do is read, maybe watch this video again, or read the book again, because um, the last thing we'll see is what is the existential fallacy. Well, the existential fallacy occurs when you make a claim of, when you conclude with the claim of existence where you didn't have one to start, right? So that means that Aristotle has a different view on wh what counts as an existential fallacy, and Boole has a different view. Aristotle's view is that if you start with the universal and move to a particular, that you haven't broken in, you haven't broken the rule because universals include existence. So all A or B to therefore some A or B. This is conditionally valid for Aristotle. It's valid for him, or it's conditionally valid because it's conditioned upon whether or not we assume with Aristotle the universals make claims about existence. Whereas by contrast, Boole would say that this is invalid. So there's sort of a debate here about whether or not this is a valid claim or an invalid claim. Um, typically, I think we should side with Boole, but you're going to see here that the book is going to tell you in the exercises whether or not to assume Aristotle or Boole's perspective. Um, and you can use Venn diagrams to evaluate the immediate inferences of the exercise and, and identify any that commit the existential fallacy. Okay, uh, We're going to sort of end it there. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover, and I honestly am not sure if I did a very good job with this video, um, but let me know. I may post a new one. You'll see that, go ahead and take a look and try to use the, combine these different, um, the square of opposition, the existential fallacy, um, and, this, and Venn diagrams, if you put it all together, you're going to build up a pretty powerful tool set to evaluate these arguments. 
Uh, next time, in our next chapter here, we're going to take a look at 4.4, which is conversion, aversion, and contraposition. These are operations that can be formed to change the to change a proposition but keep its truth functionality. Uh, so we'll take a look at this in our next section, 4.4. Okay, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you guys later. Bye.